Welcome to Behind the Book. It's time now for Behind the Book. Hosted by Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. Two authors with a passion for books, no filters, and limitless curiosity. Join them now to find out the real story behind your favorite books and authors. And now, Behind the Book. Jacqueline Mitchard is the award-winning New York Times best-selling author of 13 novels for adults, seven novels for teenagers, and five children's books. These include The Deep End of the Ocean, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, the inaugural selection of the Oprah Winfrey Book Club. She is also a professor of creative writing whose short stories, articles, essays, and book reviews have been widely published. A native of Chicago, she now lives on Cape Cod with her family. Welcome. We're so glad to have you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. You know, I just want to interrupt a little bit and say that was a very short bio, but I did a little more research, and I have to say that besides having your novel chosen as the first Oprah Book Club pick... You've also appeared on Oprah more than once. You had a popular weekly syndicated column nationwide for years. And you had Michelle Pfeiffer appear in the movie adaptation of one of your books, which is just so cool. And you're also a very widely lauded uh, speaker and you've conducted workshops. We don't have enough time for the long bio, but I just (laughs) wanted to throw a couple of those things in. Wow. Yeah, it, yeah, well, I mean, Thank could you do you. something like impressive you. with your life? I mean, come on. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the most impressive thing that m- the most the way that I can get people's jaw to drop is to explain to them that I have, through birth and adoption, nine children. That would do it. Yeah. That would do it every <laughs> single time. Exactly. And, you know, <laughs> I have three children and they've come to our family through U.S. adoption, international adoption, and then the old-fashioned way. Um, And I thought I had kids all the way a person could have kids, but you've got me beat by a lot. (laughs) Yes, yes, they're 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 pretty fabulous. I uh, I am I always marvel at people when uh, when someone tells me I have four children or I have four teenagers. I say, "Oh my goodness, how do you manage?" And then I realize. That I live <laughs> in this little house on Cape Cod, and I'm not kidding, with um, seven other people, all hanging from the rafters like bats. <laughs> That's crazy. What are the ages? My kids, the my um, my youngest is 16, and the oldest is 36. Okay. Wow. That's quite a range you've got there. Yes, it is. Yes, you've it been is. raising kids for a long time. <laughs> I have, and the uh, the younger ones are like um, are more free range. The children they're they're helping each other grow up, and and <laughs> doing a fine job of it. I might add, <laughs> <laughs> as it should be. Well, tell us a bit more about your publishing journey. We know you started as a um, as a journalist. So how did you first become a novelist? Walk us through that. Uh, it, it began, as so many things begin, with, uh, with a tragedy, a, a wake-up call. Um, I was in my 30s, in my late 30s, and I was the married mom of three little boys, and I lived in Madison, Wisconsin at that time, and my uh, husband, uh, was uh, we were at the second Clinton inaugural. He was a bit older than me. He was in his middle 40s. And he started to feel poorly. And we came home and he went to the doctor and he had colon cancer and he died within a few months. And so suddenly I was on my own and I was looking at these little faces looking up at me. They were nine, six, and three at the time. And I guess I had this thought and that even if life drives a truck through you, you have to model that dreaming big is important, right? You can't have permission to just give up on your dreams and to 
sa uh, sacrifice your um, the the second half of your life because the first half of your life has been in some ways crushed. And that's when I decided to write a novel. I had never even written a short story other than for the freshman elective at the University of Illinois at Champaign. And I started writing and I wrote about the even worse thing, which would be losing a child and not knowing what happened to the child. Now, by the time I got to the end of that uh, writing project, by the time I got to the end of the book that would become The Deep End of the Ocean, I knew it was pretty good. I mean, I thought it would get published. I never imagined what would happen to it. I never imagined uh, the crazy uh, success that that book would enjoy and how it would give me permission to go on and write other books and be a storyteller for my living. So that's really a phenomenal story, especially with the first novel right out of the gate to see it skyrocket like that. It was crazy. It was crazy. And the Oprah journey, of course, you know, people say, oh, your book was chosen as an Oprah book. And but there was no Oprah Winfrey book club when she first suggested The Deep End of the Ocean, which I actually owe to Stedman Graham because he picked that book up for her. They were at their vacation home in Indiana, their lake home. And he picked that book up for her, I believe, at a convenience store or something like that and gave it to her. And she had thought before of doing a uh, stories about fiction, but she said it was voyage to the bottom of the ratings, that people didn't want to engage with that until the book club movement started. And then everyone embraced that model of this being something that everyone is going to gossip about and talk about. And of course, that's what books are for, is gossiping about. And by the time she announced that, the first time she announced the biggest book club in the world, by my publisher said, this isn't really going to have any effect on the book. I know it's not. <laughs> they said, I mean, it's great, Jackie, you know, but no, it's really not going to have any effect because these are antithetical media. TV, people who watch TV don't read, people who read disdain daytime TV. By that night, there were 4,000 holds on the book at the New York Public Library alone. Wow. How did you, so how did you find out it had been picked? The publicist at Viking called me and said, now, you know, this is uh, Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey wants to start a book club. And everybody, everybody hastened to say to me, don't expect too much from this. And I said, <laughs> oh, okay, fine. And then they said, and they want you to come to Chicago and, uh, and be on the show. That's fine, I said. I had written a profile about Oprah Winfrey when she started. And I had a bone to pick with her because I had given her a necklace to wear on the show and she kept it. And so um, so I wanted to say, can I have my little necklace with the rhino back? Um, but I, we went to Chicago and I brought gifts for Oprah Winfrey. I brought rubber cheese heads from Wisconsin. She said to me, I don't think anyone has even offered me anything like this before. And um, <laughs> it, uh, it sort of was an unbelievable set of circumstances because it was so much more influential even than she imagined it would be. She kept calling me to get me to come on the show. And I just kept erasing it because I thought it was a, one of my friends horsing around with me. <laughs> you, you thought Oprah was pr a prank? Yes. You didn't. And oh. by the third time, I had this little guy who was an intern of mine from the University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison. And he said, Jack, you know, I think that really is Oprah Winfrey. Listen to how mad she is now. <laughs> and she said, you know, I don't know if you even live here, but if you do, could you please just do me the courtesy of returning my phone call? And I thought, oh, you know, so I called her back and I don't know, the rest is history. Lots of fun. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, now, you mentioned your nine kids, which that number is just still resonating with me. I'm trying to imagine such a thing. Does your family <laughs> read your books? I have offered my children the current rate is $125 American money to read one of my books. 
I have never spent the hundred and twenty five dollars. <laughs> Not once. No Not takers, ever. huh? Nope. They just think that it would sound like my voice nagging them. Mm. You know, we it have would... found in interviewing authors that more often than not, that's the case. That really? the families don't read their books. Oh, mm-hmm. that's thrilling to me because yes. I, I thought I was all of my friends say Oh, my second son just loved this book, but my firstborn daughter, she didn't like it at all. And I am so envious that they even have an opinion. Well, I don't know that we've had one author on that has said their children read their books. Oh, I'm sometimes a sister or or an aunt or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's an odd thing. My mother-in-law is a voracious reader and I can't even get her to read one of my books. And I don't know what, it's like the curse. I don't know what it is. It just, they just aren't interested. Fortunately, the world is filled with wonderful authors and uh, they're enjoying themselves in that regard. So that's right. Who knows so, why people do what they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And especially our children. But so tell us what a writing day looks like for you. Do you outline your books or are you more of a pantser? I am not a pantser. I am the most structure oriented and process oriented uh, one thing after another kind of writer in the whole wide world. I do what's called a narrative outline. That is to say writing, okay, in this part, Uh, this will happen. And then right after that, this will happen. And she'll realize this, uh, an outline for me to follow that is up to 15 pages long. And then when I'm doing on the ground, boots on the ground writing, I make promises to myself and say, I'm going to write up to the part where Jill goes to the restaurant. And like Ernest Hemingway famously said, I always leave something to come for the next day. I always leave part of the story that I could tell untold so that when I go back to it, I will be energized to write again. I know that many people love to write who are professional writers. I really suffer with it. I'm unhappy in the most delightful way, miserable in the most delightful way, absolutely miserable when I'm writing and come downstairs at an artist residency or with friends and they all are saying, I just was so enraptured. It was like I was taking dictation from the universe. And I want to just reach (laughs) over and give them a slap because, you know, the universe is not talking to me. The universe (laughs) is telling my characters, Go sit on the couch, crack open a beer and a bag of Doritos. And yet you come up with these beautifully written novels. So whatever you're doing is working. Well, I love stories. I, I learned really early. You know, I came from a family of people who did not have any money. And they, but they had, uh, they lived life almost uh, to, they lived life fully almost to a, an upsetting extent. So they had a lot of stories to tell. And I remember being a little kid and listening to those stories. And they would begin in these ways like, everyone knew that when Jim broke the glass on the gypsy king and queen's tomb to steal their jewelry, that he would come to a bad end. Well, you know, who could ignore that? And so I learned that by telling stories, you could have power. You could get people to pay attention to you um, who might not, if you were awkward and and uh, unusual in other ways, you could still get people to pay attention to you if you could tell a good story. And that's true, isn't it? It's absolutely true. That leads us to the next question. Speaking of good stories, do you like how I did that, Tess? Oh, um, excellent. <laughs> your newest novel, The Good Son, which I'm very much looking forward to, comes out January 22nd. And I heard that it was inspired by a chance meeting with a woman while you were getting coffee. Um, Would you mind telling us the story? I love this story. And I wish I could find her and tell her that, you know, the privilege of the artist, if you will, is not just to represent life, but to correct life. And uh, I was at a writer's conference. I was about to go on stage and speak to two or 3,000 people. And I went downstairs to get my coffee and I was standing behind a woman and she dropped her book. I handed it back to her. And I asked her whether 
she was there for the conference. And she said, no, she came every weekend to this hotel to stay overnight so that she could see her son, who was in prison. He had killed his beloved, the only girl he ever loved. He was only 19 years old. And he would probably be in prison for many years to come, at least 12 or 15 more years. And she further told me that he had been so messed up on methamphetamines at the time that he, the crime took place, he had no memory of even doing it. And I sat with her almost too long. The conference organizers came running to find me. And I sat with her while she told me about this. And she further told me that she had been friends, that were neighborhood friends with the girl's mom. And that one day she went to put roses on the girl's grave and the mom was there. And the boy's mother was terrified. And she thought, what do I do? Do I run? You know, do I uh, uh, apologize? And as it transpired, they just put their arms around each other and started to cry. It's hard for me to talk about still. And um, the girl's mother said, I know what you have to live with is not too much easier than what I have to live with, but at least you can still hug him. And that gave me the opening question for the novel, which is, would you rather have the one you love do some, the worst thing or lose the one you love most, your best beloved? Now, you won't know from my saying that what actually happens in this story, because the story twists and turns, um, and you would not imagine until the last pages what the truth of the night that girl died really is. But when I told my agent that I wanted to write this as a story, he said, "Uh, um, there's no way that you could make these characters sympathetic. But to me, they already were. They were already sympathetic because every one of us is, in a sense, we're standing on the trap door. We just don't know when the trap door is going to open. Well, the book is getting rave reviews from the media and other best-selling authors. Kristen Hanna said it was rich and complex, a compelling novel. Christina Baker Klein called it a story that is gripping, heartrending, and quietly devastating. Several early reviewers have called it your finest novel to date. Why do you think it's connecting so powerfully with readers? Well, I paid them. (laughs) (laughs) We have never had an answer like that before. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Finally, an honest answer. <laughs> you would be surprised the kind, you know, those people are tired of talking about books and you'd be surprised what they would do for a Starbucks card, you know? Um, it, no, I, I think that it is because more than any novel I have ever written, it represents the God forbids. And so when I write about it, it's as if by writing about it, I absolve everyone else of having to have something like this happen to them. And everyone, everyone fears. I mean, if you, I mean, Shakespeare was writing about is saying, he who hath a wife and child is a hostage to fortune. Everyone who has a child or someone else whom they love desperately, you surrender the part of your life that is given over to enjoyment or appreciation to spend the rest of your life worrying, basically. You know, one more day, one more day, my child is safe for one more day. And when you write a novel in which there is, are so many questions, but still some hope, I think that people are powerfully attracted to that. Because a story in which there is absolutely no hope or no solace is uh, is a story that I guess we want to avoid, but we want to feel in some ways that there is the possibility for a moment of grace, even in the darkest valley. And Thea, who's the main character in the story, she says, nothing in my life ever prepared me for anything except moderate good fortune. And then she is plunged into uh, a nightmare from which she has to find her way out by finding the truest answers she can find. So as my buddy Scott Turow, I paid him more, um, said about this story, he said, it is a meditation on the meaning of family that turns into a galloping thriller. And that's just what I intended for it to be. 
So did you um, intend to put twists and turns in the story or is that just how it came out? Yes. I, uh, I never want to have a quiet novel. I always want to say to my readers, they say, we kind of know what's going to happen now. And I say, how many pages do you have left to read? And they say 12. And I say, no, you don't. <laughs> I often because think that intrigue is what, what keeps people reading. I think so too. Reading a book is difficult. Com- making the commitment to read something that's 375 pages long and give over that part of your life, even if you love it, it's a commitment. And so it's like a bran muffin. It's, go- it's good for you right? Mm -hmm. But you don't want to eat the whole sticky in the throaty bran muffin. You know, you have to have a raisin every now and then. And that keeps you going. You get a treat every now and then, something that you didn't expect, a surprise. Uh, I just started a, a newsletter and I'm calling it The Gasp because to me, that's what makes reading so exciting is that moment when you just sort of draw in your breath because Of course you should have known from everything that came before that that was what was coming. But now you really know. The fun part of, as a reader too, is when you see that, when you get to that part where you mentioned you gasp, and then you look back and connect the dots and realize it was there the whole time. You just didn't see it. Right. And that as a writer, you know that that is the writer's truest art is to, you never hold anything back. You never hold your cards behind your back. Everything is there on the table. And Pendulette would say, you know, it's all there. You just can't see it. And Mm -hmm. that's the magician's art. So when you're writing fiction, are there some parts that are easier for you or some parts of writing fiction you find more difficult? I know they're all equally difficult. And I cannot go to the second sentence until I have the perfect first sentence. And I cannot go to the second paragraph until the first paragraph is just the way that I want it. I know that most writers who are sane go to their, uh, they, they get the whole first draft down and then they write a, another draft. And I end up, end up writing many different versions of the same book, but I always believe that the first one is the most basic because the most important, because who would say, well, I'm going to build a cathedral, but I'm just going to put part of it up now. I'm going to put it up as quickly as I can, and then I'll go back and fix it. No, you can't do that. It will fall on people and kill them. And so I try to make it perfect from the beginning. It isn't when my agent sees it, he says, I don't believe that that character would do that at all. Why don't you take him out and also chapter 17 through 23? And then I. The, the, when the editor gets hold of it, she says, you know, there's a really a curious gap between chapter 17 and, you know, d- and 24. Was there, is there missing material from there? It is a conjuring of what the, what the outcome will be. But what I'm thinking of the whole time is not the importance of the story so much as I'm thinking of the importance of the reader because it's not real until someone reads it. It's a performing art, like dancing or singing. And it's not real until the reader takes your hand and says, I understand that. Do you keep a list of story ideas as you think of them? Yes, I have a list. I know how many books are left in me. I know how many more I'll write in a general way. But I uh, would not feel comfortable with a book coming out I feel as though the good son is now going out into the world pretty soon to earn its living. And so that was my, my beloved. That was my enamorata for the year that, or the year and change that it took to write it. But now I'm having a a flirtation with the person next door and I wouldn't feel comfortable if I didn't have a new love waiting in the wings that I could give myself to, I would drive me crazy to not be working on something else because otherwise I would just be frightened that I couldn't go on in a sense. Do you have any writing advice for those writers out there who are just starting out? Yes, I do. There's two pieces. One is really hackneyed, but absolutely 
urgent. So I'll give you the unusual one first. And that is to be patient with your story. We are all told now that stories need to burst out of the gate and the everything needs to be, uh, the stakes are established and the central conflict and so forth by the opening pages. And that's what we have to, that's the way that, that books are written now. But to pause and go deeper into a character or into a description or a situation or a scene is what gives the prose its richness. So don't just think about the plot. Think about the way that the story is revealed, not just the story, but the way the story is revealed and where you want to take the place, where you want to take the time and the patience to go deeply into something that will matter to the reader then and also later on. Now here's the hackneyed advice. Read more for God's sake. I've had a hundred graduate students and of that hundred graduate students, I would say 10 of them were the kind of readers that I believe a writer should be. And the rest of them say one of two things, who has time? And the other ones say, I'm afraid that I'll become too dependent on the voices of other writers. And it's like a cold finger down my back when I hear those kinds of things coming out of the mouth of people who want to be storytellers in their lives. Because first of all, everything that you read, you also imbibe. Just as the great artists used to go to the Louvre and copy the pictures that the old masters had made in order to teach themselves the way to do those things properly. There is no sin in emulation. I can remember one time there is an old book. It's a beautiful book. It's about a girl and a horse. It's called National Velvet. And it was written by Enid Bagnold, who also wrote The Chalk Garden and some other wonderful books. And I would read that book to my sons when they were little because I wanted to read them a book, but I didn't read, want to read them anything that I wasn't interested in. So I was reading that to them. And my son, Dan, said, you know, this lady, Mom, she really copied the way you write. <laughs> now, this book was written in 1935. And I said, you know, that's right, Dan, she did. Um, but what I realized is how influenced my prose was by Enid Bagnall's prose. And at first I was a little embarrassed. And then I thought, no, you know, that is in the tradition of art for us to, to find those artists we most admire and take their ways into our own molecules. That's how you become a master at your craft, if you will, is by learning from others and by copying them. And it's also true. You that way you don't need to reinvent the wheel. I mean, other people have done it and done it well. I find myself reading books and thinking, oh, nice transition, or what a lovely way to describe that. And it's not that I'm I'm going to plagiarize that, but I will keep it in mind so I can do my version of it. That is the essence of it. It's not plagiarism to emulate your betters. And in fact, when I teach my students, sometimes I'll give those students a paragraph by Truman Capote or a paragraph by uh, from Rebecca and ask them to write it in the style that those writers would have used. Write something from their own experience in that style. And it's a very helpful exercise because you learn different ways. No one is born knowing every way to express Uh, a thought or to describe something. So you learn from the people who did it better than you until you can do it better yourself. Yeah, I believe it's um, one of the craft books that I love is uh, How to Tell a Story. And it's uh, Alice LaPlante, I think. I may have that wrong. We'll put it in the show notes if I am. But she talks about reading as a writer and doing that very thing, you know, as you're reading something for enjoyment, of course, or whatever, but just what Karen said, oh, that's interesting what they did there. And it gets in here somewhere. 
Stephen King's book on writing is a wonderful book. And he talks about how lucky he is to have been able to be a voracious reader all his life from childhood on and how much he learned simply from how much he learned as a writer, how much he realized he knew when he went to write his own stories. There was that whole chorus of professors standing behind him who taught him this, who taught him that. And I, I feel the same way that I have been, I have been to the university of good reading. Mm. And that's what taught me to be a writer. I love that. Uh, speaking of Stephen King, uh, you're obviously familiar with his book on writing. And he talks a lot about in there about, you know, finding that one person that you're writing for. Do you have a reader in mind? I do have a reader in mind. And this is silly, okay? I'm going to tell you right now it's silly. But it, I have had so many letters from this individual. And she says, my husband gave me your book, whatever book it was, as an anniversary present. And we went to a bed and breakfast. My husband hates you now because <laughs> I spent my whole night sitting in the bathtub with no water in it, reading your book while he was in the other room, you know, drinking wine and eating chocolate strawberries. And that's who I'm writing for is that person who will bring the book in the car and only safely read the book when she drops her kids off at school and then she can pull into a parking lot and sit there and read a chapter before she has to go home and, or, or go to her office and resume the rest of her day. I want people to be uh, obsessed with these stories and I am trying my best to enthrall that reader as though this was not only not a waste of time, but something that he or she will remember always. Now you had mentioned you have um, story ideas that you sort of collect. Is there a book that you've been dying to write, but for whatever reason you haven't just yet? Yes, there is a book, and I may have to literally die to write it. Um, I want to write a great ghost story. One of my favorite books is The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Jackson. An amazingly, beautifully written book. And so scary, it makes my breath stop. The book is even scarier than the original movie, which is darn scary. A Great Ghost Story is a book that I would love to write. And I read ghost stories all the time. I buy books and I and people say, this is just such a wonderful spine tingling ghost story. And I don't even have to leave the light on. I'm not talking about a slasher story. I'm not talking about a serial killer story. I'm talking about a haunted house story or a haunted person story. The best other than that, the best ghost stories I've ever read were written by Edith Wharton. Those are scary. I read some of them one night and I had to put the book outside my room and shut the door <laughs> so that the book wouldn't get me during the night. <laughs> so I would love to do that. And, um, and also, I want to set up the most outrageous possible scenarios and let my poor characters try to fight their way out of them without them being something that couldn't happen to anyone. So right now I'm working on one that I think is going to be a dilly because it is, it's so upsetting in a number of ways without being, I mean, it's not like, you know, about cannibals or anything like that, but it's, it's very upsetting in a number of ways. And I'm excited every time I get to pull something like that off. Now, getting back to the ghost story, because that intrigues me. I would yeah. love to read a, a ghost story written by Jacqueline Machard. Do you feel like it's percolating in there? And at one day you'll wake up a year or two or five years from now, and you'll be like, it's ready to be told. Nope. Oh. Um, because, <laughs> that because was my theory. <laughs> I, um, I don't think that I have the, well, first of all, there's a kind of book that a reader of Jacqueline Machard wants to read. And I want to write that story too. And it's not really a ghost story. What I have done is I wrote a shorter ghost story that is an homage to my mentor. It's like a trick. It's never been published. And it's 
for people who go to my website and sign up for my newsletter will get a copy of that story so they can read it. And it is, it's called Haunter's Houses. And it's about the houses where the great horror story and ghost story writers live. And it's written from the perspective of a TV news reporter who has to uh, write about the very humble house in Winnetka, Illinois, where Ray Bradbury lived. And Ray Bradbury was my mentor, uh, a generous and dear man. I never and, knew that. Ray Bradbury. Yeah. How, how did you meet him? I Long ago, uh, long ago, uh, I was, uh, when I was first, when I was a young wife, I was married to a man who had been married before, and he had a little girl who was like five at the time. And I read to her, I sing the body electric, you know, about the robot grandmother. Again, a story I can't talk about very much or I'll start to cry. And after that, I wrote to Ray Bradbury. I wrote the only fan letter I've ever written in my life. I was sitting in the newsroom a few weeks later. The copy, this is how long ago it was. They gave you mail, you know, from the copy kid, came up and gave you mail. So this is like back in the 80s or something, and or the early 90s, I'm not sure which. And it was this envelope, and it had drawings all over it. And they were of fantastical creatures, vampires, and uh, creatures with great green wings and dragons. And, and all it said on it was to Jacqueline Machard, a very good writer indeed, Madison, Wisconsin. And it reminded me of the letter in our town that's written to the girl. And it says, you know, New Hampshire, North America, mind of God, right? I open it up and it's this long letter from Ray Bradbury about my writing, what I should read, how to stick to it. And, and that began a friendship that lasted almost 40 years until he died at a great age some years ago. And a bunch of us wrote stories for a collection called Shadow Show. And this is, again, uh, Alice Hoffman, Audrey ne Nevenegger, Joe Hill, uh, a bunch of people who were influenced by Ray, but perhaps had not ever met him in person. And, uh, and I wrote a story for that, too. And he was thrilled by all those stories. He, he said that this inspired the story Haunter's Houses. He said he felt like he was the father whose children had all come home. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know. Well, you should read the, you should read this. I will send you, if you go to my website and sign up for my newsletter. I, you know what? I will. And I bet you got a bunch of signups after this podcast. But I, would, I will send it to you anyway. And if you can read this story without getting a tear in your eye, then you are not human because it is based on my favorite and many people's favorite Ray Bradbury story, The Homecoming, which is about, do you know it? It's about no. a family of vampires and they're having their traditional Halloween party and all the vampires and mummies and strange creatures from all over the world come to this house for the homecoming that night. And there's a huge party. And um, But this family has a tragedy in it. They have a child who is mu a mutant. He's human. And so they know that someday Timothy will die. And they are distraught about it. He's their youngest and they love him dearly. And at the end of the story, the mother says to the little boy, even if you die every year at the homecoming, we'll come to where you are and tuck you in all the tighter. And it is the sweetest, saddest story in the world about love and the fact that we are not eternal, but love is. How about that? <laughs> How about that? You have a speechless here. <laughs> wow. Have you ever started a novel manuscript and then made the deliberate decision not to finish it? No, I have started a novel and made the forced decision not to finish it. When um, my wonderful agent said to me, this just, I don't know what the hell, you know, this is not coming together. It was a great idea. So what? and I had to abandon it. It broke my heart. And this was just after giving a speech in which I, I proudly said that I had never, I did not have an unfinished or an unpublished novel. 
be careful what you say in public. <laughs> so yeah, I was a great, it was what I thought was a great idea. He thought it was a great idea. Nope. Did you agree with him that it didn't work? Yes. Oh, mm. that's well, I heartbreaking. Pretended, I pretended I didn't. But I, did. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, you know, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we fool ourselves sometimes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever done that? I have a, a couple documents in, uh, on my hard drive that are like 30, 40 pages that I just didn't feel compelled to keep going. Um, I haven't done it in a number of years, but to get through the majority of a book and finish, I think that would be really tough. This was about mm -hmm. half. Okay. And I laid it away tenderly, and I don't know if I will ever go back to it. Now I think that once you set an outward course, mm -hmm. you're probably better off than returning to things that one thing I can never understand is when writers say that they would like to go back to books that have been published and rewrite them and correct the things that uh, were wrong with them. I can never understand that because to me, there's always another chance to redeem yourself mm. and there's always another at bat. What I would like to do is to be able to buy some of the copies of books that I wish were never published so that I could burn them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's I, different. No, I know. I'm not going to tell you which ones they are. Okay. I was going to yeah, well, Sam Shepard was famous for changing his plays um, after they had been performed for, for years and years. Uh, and I always just shook my head about that because I thought, gosh, how... I didn't know that. Yeah, it's it's a... Uh, strange to me to think of him like laying awake at night thinking, oh, that line was not right. I have to go back and fix it. You know? To me, when they're finished, people say to me, how do you feel when you read your books after they've been published? And I say, <laughs> I mean, why would I, I could read someone, a good book. Why would I <laughs> read my own book for God's sake? I mean, it's as if wow. um, I have no years later, Sometimes I've looked at a paragraph or a page in a book that's already been published. And the don't ever do this, by the way. Okay. Okay. Because what, here's what you're going to think. Boy, I was smarter than. <laughs> Is that what occurs to you every time? <laughs> yes. Wow. I was smarter then. And I took more chances. Better shut this book. Okay, well, I won't do that then. <laughs> <laughs> How consumed are you with the story when you're in the middle of writing a book? Absolutely consumed. As though when I go to sleep at night, I will say to myself, I mean, some of the problems that I have in prose, I sometimes can solve in my sleep overnight. And so I will say to myself before I go to sleep, I'm going to go be with Frankie now. And this is the problem that I have to solve. And so I'm with them sleeping and waking. Of course, I can take time out in which I'm devoted to other things. But that story is always on the ba in the background, always talking to me until, and sometimes you know how this is. I say, okay, never going to be able to figure this out. Might as well move to a different town and get a funny nose and change my name and get a nice job making pizza because I know I'm good at that and because I cannot work out what I'm going to do. And then it's such a blessing when it finally comes to you. And it's been there all the time. It's been there in your subconscious all the time. But there's such a desperation connected with not knowing what to do next. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, Ray Bradbury was your mentor, something that I'm still trying to process. <laughs> yeah. uh, but who was your biggest supporter as you were building your uh, craft and career? Well, he was. He was an enormous help, an enormous support to me. I met with him several times over the years, and I sent him everything that I wrote. I mean, I I cannot say that I had a, another writing mentor who was as generous and devoted to uh, to my welfare. Now, one of my great friends, Anne Garvin, who is a novelist and who is the founder of the Tall Poppies, the largest organization for women authors and uh, supporting other women authors, 
who is an absolute doll, before I write anything, I tell the story to Anne. And she'll say, but would he do that? Or why doesn't she do that instead? So it's after I tell it to her, and she does the same thing with me, and we sort of pick at the structure of what the story is going to be, that I feel that I can start writing. Are you working on anything right now, and can you share it? Sure. I'm working on a book that I hope keeps this same title. Do you hear that, guys? Um, <laughs> and the, the title is Saltwater, and it because saltwater is not just water in the ocean, but is tears and blood as well. And it's uh, about a woman who thinks she will always live the rover's life. She's an underwater photographer and she travels all over the world solo. She comes home to Cape Cod to tell her father and her best friend and her brother that something has happened to her that she never imagined she would happen. She's fallen in love. She's going to get married. She's going to have a baby. But it turns out that her surprise is about one sixteenth of the surprise they have for her. Oh, you're going to leave us wondering. I love that. I have to. I have to. <laughs> and I hope they let you keep the title because I love titles with hidden meanings or dual mm -hmm. meanings like that. Me yeah. I, I hope they do too. I hope the, the, the father has a, a charity called the Saltwater Foundation too. So I'm hoping I'm larding it in there and I'm hoping that they'll let me, you know, but who knows? I mean, there were 27 alternative titles for the good son. Wow. Titles are tricky. You know, I have a book called Dovetail that I loved and it had a dual meaning. And um, I was told that the people in marketing who I think are all a lot younger than me were like, they don't know what a dovetail is. <laughs> and I was like, but it's so perfect because, and I really made a, a you know, I made an impassioned plea and, and I was allowed to keep it and it's worked out. So I give it my, I give Saltwater my vote. I have made impassioned pleas many times and so has my agent and uh, the publisher in only in two cases. But in those two cases, the publisher said, eh. so there you go. Well, but but, you know, after a while, you start to think that the title that it has was your original idea because your heart can't bear the strain. <laughs> <laughs> well, this comes to the part of the podcast where we ask our fun bonus questions. Ooh. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, what is one food that will never get past your lips? Uh, Brussels sprouts. Who would you want to play you in a movie? Susan Sarandon. Perfect. What superpower would you pick given the opportunity? Invisibility. What's your biggest guilty pleasure? Wait a minute, I can't think of anything. Um, <laughs> um, I have no pleasures. Oh, um, I don't know. Okay, what would you? Oh, say? you're going to throw it back at us. <laughs> <laughs> what would um, you say, you guys? I watch a reality show that is so, well, it's Lame. called Married at First Sight. And I have no idea why this intrigues me so much. But I, that's, that would be my guilty pleasure. Also, chocolate. Okay. How about yeah. you, Tess? Uh, I guess mine would be wine. Although I have not had any for over a month now because I'm trying to lose weight. So it's no longer what guilty you pleasure. Want to become a fetus? You know, I'm already, like, really thin. What she is know? really thin. You haven't really seen really part of me that is not showing. I really, I should be fasting then. Um, <laughs> you know, my 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 uh, Zoom thing is going to be, like, up on the roof. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to be looking at it so I didn't have ch chins, like, in a Vermeer painting. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess my biggest guilty pleasure would be The Sopranos. Mm. Oh. I I okay, have that's a watched good one. it over and over, and I know that I will watch it over again. And the only thing that I wish is that I hadn't seen it. Mm. So you could watch it again for the first time. Yeah, so I oh. could see it for the first time. I am not a TV watcher. People recommended it to me, and I said, oh, pish tosh. And then I started to watch it, and I was absolutely enraptured. I wish it would have lasted for 100 years. So next question, what is the worst job you've ever had? Oh, I worked on the line in a potato chip factory. If you could instantly become an expert in something, what would it be? Plants. 
and plants and animals and their their uh, Latin names. Because when I read a book in which people are talking about the the flora, I find that almost erotic. It's fascinating. What is your favorite smell? Toast. That's a good Butter one. Toast. What is the most terrifying thing you've ever done? Swim with sharks. And what? I did not know how they felt about me at that time. And the way that they, I thought that, you know, I really believed that they would not eat you. But, um, but actually, it was just probably because they were having an off day. Were you in a, wow. were you in a cage? No, no, I was oh, scuba diving. Wow. Oh and, my goodness. And yeah, and I don't know why I did that. Um, it they look at you just like they say in Jaws with that doll's eye, <laughs> like you're a corned beef sandwich. And I thought, you know, they that sharks don't eat people, but they do. I mean, on Cape Cod we learned people learned that the hard way, uh, mm. in the past few years. So yeah, that's sorry. No, that um, definitely qualifies as terrifying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wow. What's one thing you're really bad at? Oh, my God. Well, okay. Here. I'm going to look. See the drawer next to my bed? <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> should we tell our listeners that everything's very tidy? <laughs> or should we tell them the truth? Right, here's, here's my closet. <laughs> okay. I, I see. I, um <laughs> I, I uh, am very bad at organizing things. And also when people say, but I know where everyone, everything is, I don't. <laughs> I don't know where anything is. But, you, but so. you're really good at being honest, which I love. <laughs> well, yes, yes, I am good at that. If you could live your life over again, would you want to? Yes, stem to stern, soup to nuts. I would, I would love to live it over again with an awareness of having lived it, but not to be immortal because then, you know, that would be the saddest thing in the world because you would be without the ones you love. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. I can't hey, wait to read. This has been so much fun. Good son. Yes. Oh, I can't wait either. And I can't thank wait for our listeners so much, to hear Beth. this episode. It's going to be amazing. You guys, I really appreciate this. All right. And thank you. And um, we'll be in touch, huh? Yes, definitely. Thanks again. We're so honored that you were here. I'm delighted. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Behind the Book, brought to you by authors Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and post a question in the comment section. This has been Behind the Book. <laughs>